Welcome to Coastside Poetry. Thank you all for joining us this lovely afternoon. I'm Diane Lee Mooney with Steve Long co-hosting. It's Sunday, October 3rd, and here we are at an extra October event, another salon in our Ars Poetica series where we explore various poetic forms. This program is live streaming on YouTube as we speak. So glad you all could join in. Today, we're gonna to talk Villanelle. We've invited Villanellistas Annie Finch, Julie Kane, and Jenna Lee to join us. Welcome, and thanks so much for being here. In a moment, we'll ask each of you to talk about your personal dance with this wonderful form, and then to talk with each other about your Villanelling journals. Both Zoom Room and live stream participants are invited to post questions at any time in the chat box. We'll address these in the Q&A. I'm expecting a pretty lively conversation to arise naturally from that. This part of today's event will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel very soon. After the Q&A, Steve will turn off the live stream feature and we'll begin an informal read around starting with one villanelle each and going around again till we get tired. Making this part private gives our open mic poets an opportunity to read material that might be close to the bone or read new material that might not be quite ready yet or something they wish to submit to a journal that considers a YouTube video as publication. I'll post the readers list in the chat by and by. And if you don't see your name on it and would like to read a Villanelle, um, just add your name in because we have plenty of room on the list. And now please welcome our panelists who I'll introduce you one at a time and have each of you tell a little bit about how you came to the form, maybe some of its history, some of your favorite Villanelle poets, read some of your own work, whatever you'd like to say about it. Julie, I'll start with you. I understand your doctoral dissertation was on the Villanelle. How, how interesting, how exciting. Yes, and there's a story behind that. <laughs> I've got some notes here. I'll, I'll, I'll read for a couple of minutes and then, and then read one. Um, these days, we take it for granted that even a predominantly free verse poet like Rita Dove or Tracy K. Smith can write a villanelle if they feel like it, if it's the best vehicle for what needs to be expressed. But that was not the case in the late 1980s when I started writing them. Back then, poets writing in form were presumed to be conservative Republicans whose ideas about contemporary poetry were stuck in the 19th century. Robert Bly was one of the leading poets and poetic you know, voices of the 1970s and early 80s. And this is what he said in 1980, quote, as Whitman saw it, the rhymed metered poem is in our consciousness so tied to the feudal stratified society of England that such a metered poem refuses to merge well with the content of American experience. We therefore have no choice but to write free verse, unquote. So when I started writing a streak of villanelles, I really worried about myself. I was young. I thought I was politically progressive. I was immersed in contemporary poetry. What was wrong with me being drawn to the villanelle? And at the same time, there were some snooty formalists who would have had you believe that fixed forms were set in stone and that any variations of the refrain or writing one that wasn't an iambic pentameter or something was unacceptable, lazy, amateurish. And I was treating the Villanelle form as kind of like a foundation to improvise on the way a jazz musician might improvise on a known melody. So that camp frightened me too on the other side. And that started me wondering, how does a fixed form get fixed in the first place? Like, what are the politics behind it? And that's what led me to my doctoral dissertation at LSU, 
titled How the Villanelles Form Got Fixed. And um, basically, to sum up about 300 some pages in a couple of sentences, both camps, the form attackers and the snooty formalists, were full of it. The 16th century Italian musical villanella was a craze that spread to France. Those musical villanellas were composed by skilled composers who were inspired by rural peasant songs from the oral tradition. Um, the only poetic feature their lyrics had in common was the presence of a refrain. Nothing else poetically was the same about them. Um, French poets got inspired by that musical craze. They wrote poems titled Villanelle, and um, those poems usually had rustic subject matter. They had a refrain. Otherwise, their forms had nothing in common with each other. There was exactly one 16th century Villanelle by Jean Passerat in the form that we would recognize today, the A1B, A2. And um, that was just a nonce form, just one you know, of the many different you know, varieties of Villanelle poems of the 16th century. And it wasn't until the middle of the 19th century that a second one got written in that form, actually as a parody, as kind of like a joke. And um, then we had the fixed forms revival of the later 19th century and a lot of other poets believing that the Villanelle had a long tradition behind it, you know, took it up along with these genuinely old forms. But even then in both France and England, there was no fixed number of stanzas. There was no fixed metrical pattern to it. Um, the very first anthology of fixed forms that came out in England in 1887 had 32 Villanelles in it women as men as, as well as men writing them. And um, they ranged from six to 10 stanzas in length. Some of them were trochaic. There was iambic um, trimeter, tetrameter, pentameter. Some poets buried their refrain. So basically at no time in history, you know, was there anything that you could say was, you know, fixed. <laughs> And both camps were wrong in claiming that the form was somehow elitist. You know, its origins are in oral peasant song, you know, from, um, from, you know, from, from the oral poetic tradition. And, and then, you know, the camp saying that there were rules that could never be broken were wrong too. So at that point, I stopped worrying about being drawn to the form <laughs> and wrote a whole lot more of them. And I'll read one of those very early ones that I wrote. And ironically, it's um, also one of the, the one that Annie took for her Villanelle's anthology, but it's called Kissing the Bartender. And I think you can see the very refrain in it. The summer we kissed across the bar, I felt 16 at 36. As if you were a movie star, I had a crush on from afar. My chest was flat. My legs were sticks the summer we kissed across the bar. Balancing on the rail was hard. Filled beer made my elbows stick. You could have been a movie star, backlit, golden, lofting a jar of juice or Bloody Mary mix the summer we kissed across the bar. Over the sink, the lines, as far as you could lean, you leaned, I kissed the movie screen, a movie star. Drinks stayed empty, ashtrays tarred. The customers got mighty pissed the summer we kissed across the bar. Summer went by like a shooting star. Thank you. Thanks so much, Julie. Mm. Oh, I can see you kissing across the bar. That's, that's a very sweet image. Um, Annie, Annie Finch, um, let's hear about your dance with this form. And first, I'm going to plug your um, Villanelle book. Anyone who is interested in um, you have it too, going further. Or if you want to take her, her class, her Villanelle class, which is starting 
on October 11th. I've put links for both of those in the chat. So, Annie Finch, I will meet myself. Thank you, Diane. Uh, and thank you, Julie. That was wonderful. I, it's just fascinating. Always, every time I hear you talk about the Villanelle, I learn something new, even though I've already heard you talk about it and read your writings on it. And Julie, actually, you wrote the introduction to that little uh, anthology as well. But there's always something new. Fascinating. Thank you. And I, I was just thinking about that Villanelle of yours, kissing across the bar. It's almost like the two refrain lines kissing across the bar of the, the other line, of the B line. I never thought of that before. But uh, so this form to me, the Villanelle, um, I was really glad to hear uh, Julie quote Robert Bly from 1980, because I came up about that same time. And um, I had a a difficult time uh, with, the, I, I think for me, this form, um, I had a sort of a love hate thing with it for a long time. Um, I remember I would use it in the beginning for only, only when I was angry, like for a while, I really thought I could only write villanelles about things I was really, really angry about. Like when I was getting my MA in creative writing, and I was like the only formalist in the program. This was 1983, I think. And every time I brought a formal poem to workshop, people would say, well, this is good, but it would be a lot better if it wasn't in form. Why don't you just take it out of form? I mean, that's, you know, that was just the standard approach. And uh, so I, I got so frustrated, for example, with the other poets in that program that I wrote this really acidic villanelle and the, the rhyming lines were like, um, is there enough emotion here for you? <laughs> You'd find you don't need what you think you do. Because they were like, you know, that I could be more direct in my emotion if I didn't have form. And it just really annoyed me because to me, there is nothing more moving than emotion through form. Um, and I now think that a lot of it has to do with whether we approach poems on the page or through the ear. And that a poem like the Villanelle really is designed to be heard, sung as the troubadours originally sang them, as I understand it. I hope that's correct, Julie. Um, and so it's um, you know a very different thing if you read it on the page or if you're the type of poet or poet or poetry lover who, when you encounter a poem, you hear it. You either hear it silently in your mind as you read, or maybe you sort of um, you hear the voice inside, or you like to say it aloud, then you're going to have a, a different relationship with form. And it's, I think, going to be closer to the way form is intended to move us through our bodies, through our ears, through our mouths. So I, I was attracted very much to the Villanelle for its incantatory qualities. Uh, and yet, I think I felt that I only resorted to it as a, as a last resort when I was really angry. And I discovered because of that, it's power, that it had a way of allowing things to come out that I could not say in a more direct way. I couldn't say them in the sun and I couldn't say them in free verse, but if there were really subterranean emotions and I had a lot of trouble when I was younger expressing anger in a direct way um, as a young woman who'd been brought up to be very well behaved and polite and feminine. And I, I think for me, anger was sort of a more subterranean feeling. And that's probably why I had that feeling about villanelles at that time. Um, so as the as the years went by, I became more comfortable with it, and I began to love this form deeply, and to feel that it had a lot to offer um, that that other forms were just simply not approaching. Um, the sonnet, for example, was invented by a lawyer. It has a very logical structure, um, especially the English or Shakespearean sonnet, of course, with that couplet at the end. Whereas the Villanelle, it came out of a folk dance, is uh, my understanding. And it's it feels to me much more democratic, much more flowing, much more... Um, you know, accessible in a certain sense. They're very easy to teach people to write them, disarmingly easy, considering how hard it is to write a good one. Um, but it's very easy to kind of go through the motions because you have all those lines repeating. So of your 19 lines, you know, whatever, how many of them is it? The, is it uh, 10 of them or whatever, or whatever, however many are already done for you, basically. Um, so, you know, it's, 
it just it's interesting how easy it is to get through it and yet how hard it is to write a good one when i was co-editing the villanelle's anthology uh for every man's library that um, diane and julie were holding up that book i was co-editing it with marie elizabeth molly and it was remarkable we had hundreds and hundreds of villanelles to look at and i think we disagreed maybe once or twice I mean, we just were always, okay, yes, in, out, we could just tell like instantly. It's it's hard to fake a Villanelle, either it works or it doesn't. And um, it's, you know, that's one thing I love about form. It's so exacting. It's more of a risk, but when, when, you, when you pull it off, the payoff is so priceless. And, and that's how it is with a great Villanelle. There were so many poets who in their careers in the 20th century only wrote one or two Villanelles, and yet they would be some of their most memorable poems. We have um, Elizabeth Bishop's One Art, for example, one of her best poems, Theodore of that Rethke's The Waking, arguably his best, if not one of his very best poems. Sylvia Plath's Mad Girl's Love Song, I also think one of her very best poems. Um, Dylan Thomas says, do not go gentle. Again, one of his very best poems. So, you know, if you're writing a villanelle of that quality, you only need one or two in your lifetime. Um, so maybe I should have stopped earlier on, but I have kept writing them. And um, in my new book, I have, I'm going to have a couple of villanelles, one written in iambic pentameter when I was in uh, very young, um, in about 1990, and then one written very recently in response to Sylvia Plath, actually. Um, and I thought I, I might share that one. How many people are familiar with Sylvia Plath's poem, The Moon and the Yew Tree? So, okay, well, this is a response to that poem and I wrote it uh, in a Villanelle form. And actually I'm gonna read a different one, but I'll just share a little of it that um, it, I wanted to do a tribute to this poem and there were fragments of it that I couldn't let go of. And I wanted it to be sort of a redemptive spell because to me that poem of Sylvia Plath's, um, if you don't know it, it's a very grim poem. It begins, this is the light of the moon, cold and planetary, the trees of the moon are black. It's just, it's very spooky and creepy and it ends with this image of the moon being kind of hooded and sort of, and not, and a very, um, dismissive and severe kind of a mother figure. And it's uh, it's a disturbing and, and, and sad poem. And yet to me, it's one of Plath's most powerful poems uh, and one of the ones where she engages most directly with something that's very important to me, which is the tradition of women-centered spirituality and uh, the idea of the goddess or um, to, to me, the, the muse and the goddess are very closely related. So this is one of the poems of Plath that I really wanted to deal with in some way. And so I, I just, I, collected all these fragments from it and they began to constellate into a villanelle. So if you know the poem, you'll recognize little quotes. And if you don't, I hope it'll make you wanna go read Sylvia Plath's great poem, The Moon and the Yew Tree. The Yew, epigraph, the moon is my mother, Sylvia Plath. She takes me in, deep in, till I'm exiled, then pricks my ankles with small bats and owls. The moon's my mother. She grows bald and wild, turning us through our blue nights, long beguiled, dark needing light. Though every steeple scowls, the door is open. I will be her child. Which is our face? Was it ours till we smiled? Eight great tongues find a ninth that sprouts and prowls. The moon's my mother. She grows bald and wild, singing the touch that's still unreconciled, spinning out the inheritance of growls. That door is open. I will be her child to line the nest we have not yet defiled with grass unloading griefs or gods till it howls. The moon's my mother. She grows bald and wild as Mary was before they made her mild. Gather our draping hoods, our snoods, our cowls. The moon's my mother. She grows bald and wild. That door is open. I will be her child.
Oh, thank you so much for that, Annie. And I've put um, the title of Plath's poem, I hope I got it right. Um, the Moon is a Yew Tree, was that the, the title of the, the mother poem? Just not, I put that into the chat. Yeah, okay. Oh, thank you so much, Annie. Oh. Um, Jenna, I've been eager to learn more about you and your work with the Villanelle. Please tell us about it. Hi, yeah, so I was actually a little bit surprised when I was asked to be in this panel, so I'm not, I'm not so much of a deep authority on, on the Villanelle. I haven't been engage with it, I know it's nearly as long as either Julie or Annie. Um, honestly, like if I'd identify myself with form, I feel much more comfortable, for example, with the sonnet form. And um, Jenna, Jenna, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you need to adjust your mic. Okay. It's really hard to hear you. Can you turn up the volume? Sure, um, let me see if I can figure out how to do that. Is this, tell me if this is okay, if you can hear me okay. Uh, it's, it's, okay? it's better right now. Yeah, have you just moved closer? All right, I'm just gonna lean in a little. If, if this okay. is okay, I'll talk like this. Um, so, so I guess, um, I guess, hopefully, my perspective is valuable as somebody who is more, who is newer to the Villanelle form and who hasn't been engaged with it as long as either Julie or Annie. Um, it's not a form I feel as comfortable with as some other forms. Um, I feel, for example, that sonnets, for example, come much more easily to me, whereas the Villanelle is something I still struggle with, but maybe that's, in, in, in the struggle, maybe that's a valuable perspective to share as well. Um, so the first Villanelle I ever read, um, and this is maybe true of, I don't know, maybe many other people as well, was uh, Sylvia Plath's uh, Mad Girl's Love Song. Um, so it's interesting to hear Annie read that her her relationship with the Villanelle is also, also uh, somewhat mediated through Plath, because uh, I first came across the Villanelle by, by chance. It was in the, in the end matter of uh, the edition of uh, the bell jar that I had checked out from the library. Um, and it, it struck me immediately. It's a, hard, it's a hard poem to forget. It's immediately striking, um, partly because of the things Plath brings to it, her, her commitment to speaking as a, as a young woman, a young woman marginalized for, for mental illness, but, but also for, for her, how, how staunchly she commits to this form, which was, which was uh, new to me at the time. And I think what initially struck me about the form was that I, I, was, I was struck by how, how it seems to stand at the intersection between, between speech and song, right? We think about a refrain, Every, everyone, we all know what a refrain is. I think from early childhood, you know, we hear nursery ballads and folk songs and pop songs on the radio and they have refrains and a refrain is something that belongs to the world of, of, of song, of lyric. Um, we don't, you know, as we go through our daily lives ordering coffee or, you know, at, on the phone at work, we don't, we don't use refrains. We don't tend to repeat ourselves in this ritualized way. But the Villanelle, I, I feel especially contemporary Villanelle sort of bring together this melding of, of song with, with other lines, with non-refrain lines, but try to, at least to some extent, engage with the cadence of, of natural speech. So you have this sort of fusion of, a, of speech and song. Um, and at the same time, you have this fusion of the, of the narrative and, the, and of the lyric, which I found, found interesting, right? I think, I think one of the great challenges um, I find, especially as somebody who's relatively new to the Villanelle Forum compared to some other people is that because the refrains occur at such short intervals, there's a danger that if you, if you don't approach it very mindfully, the refrain after a while, it gets repeated so often it starts to sound like nonsense, right? You start, there's a danger that if you don't uh, attend to it mindfully, like the way, it's, it's like repeating a mantra, right? It's part of a religious practice that if you don't attend to it mindfully, then each time it recurs, it starts to sound a bit like babble, like when you stare at a word too long and it doesn't really look like a word anymore. So, so the, I think, I feel the, the greatest challenge for, for an early Villanelle practitioner is to approach the refrain in a way that that the reader doesn't tune it out, that each new recurrence brings a new layer of meaning. And there's different ways of doing this, right? And I feel like um, arguably that like what one strategy is to keep the words of the refrain exactly the same each time it appears, but simply to change their meaning by changing the context around them. Um, 
another way of doing it is to vary the words of the refrain a little bit each time it appears, right? This is what Bishop does in one art, for example, when she shifts from saying, initially she says the art of losing isn't hard to master. And then by the end, she's saying the art of losing is not too hard to master. So there's a subtle shift in the actual word choices. And then I think that the third strategy, which always appealed to me as somebody who came from, from a mathematical background, like a, pu a puzzle solving background is when people keep the words the same, but they change around the punctuation. It's kind of like a very word play heavy approach. And you can see this, for example, like Austin Allen and his villain now, sure, you know, he, he keeps the words the same in the, in the refrain each time, but the last time it occurs, he changes the punctuation. So it goes from, can you refuse? You can't be sure you can. And then the last time it's, can you refuse? You can't be sure, you can. So, so I think all, having, having this wide variety of different strategies for approaching the central problem of the Villanelle, I think is part of what appealed to me and kind of what made me want to approach the challenge of the Villanelle. And, and I think it, it sort of reminds me of certain pop songs on the radio um, where you know each time the refrain occurs, it, it changes a little bit in a way that kind of advances the narrative of the song. Um, a song I was thinking about when I was preparing for this uh, panel is a, there was a song on the radio when I was a kid. It's like a Del Mitri song. It's called Always the Last to Know. And each time the refrain comes back, like one word changes. And each time it changes, it tells you a little bit more, advances the narrative of this relationship a little bit more. And that, that always intrigued me, the idea that a refrain could change in ways that would advance would advance the narrative of a poem. So I, I love the way the villain scans it, kind of the kind of the crux between between narrative and lyric. And that's sort of what appeals to me about it. Um, and I, I like what Annie says about, about the Villanelle being something for the for the ear, but also I think it has a very arresting shape for the eye as well with the, with the kind of the odd numbers of lines in each of the stanzas. And, and I sort of think of it, you know, we grow up being used to stanzas, you know, I think the stanza that we're most familiar with from Chowda is the four line quatrain in ABAB, it feels very symmetrical, very complete. And then the Villanelle, all of a sudden you have these kind of off kilter odd number line stanzas that feel kind of incomplete where kind of the A rhyme is kind of drowning out the B rhyme. And it starts, it starts out as a subtle imbalance, like two to one, but you know, over the course of the poem that compounds and compounds until by the end, the A rhyme is spoken what, over twice as often as the B rhyme. And that, that sense of, of, of imbalance um, has always appealed to me because I feel it speaks to, it speaks to, uh, it, it makes the villain very well suited for themes of, of cognitive dissonance where you have a, a conscious thought and then warring against it, you have a quieter but yet insistent subconscious thought. Um, and you see that for example in one art by Elizabeth Bishop, right? Where you have one voice, you know, the conscious voice saying, you know, the loss is no big deal. And then you have this other quieter voice saying, you know, maybe it is a big deal. And so I, I, I love how villanelles are great for exploring like ambivalence, ambivalence toward loss or love or desire. So I'm just gonna read one of mine. Um, this is called uh, The Reader. By the house, my, my volume's okay, it's, it's okay. Okay, um, the reader. Don't date a lot of boys. It's better far to marry your first love like I did, the gray haired woman said. The teen girl scoffed at this advice. She longed to carry out what she thought to be a full life, rich with a varied experience, like in the novels she had read. And so she dated many boys and did not marry at all. And sad guitarists sang her wild, unwary heart, her tangled hair, her hot, impulsive head. The girl basked in their singing and it went on to carry on love affairs whose bitterness was legendary that ended in glass shards and horse heads left in beds. And when she'd had her fill, she thought at last she would marry for wedded life and childbirth too have literary worth featuring in many novels central threads. And so she found a husband who was proud to carry into their house his bride whose interplanetary picaresque past just proved she had tried and risked and bled. They raised a girl and boy and they stayed happily married. She never spoke of that one throbbing scar she carried. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you so much. Um, 
I have one question for all of you or anyone who wishes to reply before we you know, go move on to the question and answer part of our, um, our program. Do you ever write a poem in one form and then decide it would be better as a villanelle? I can start I because I've done that. I've started free yeah. verse poems in it. So I'm just curious. Yeah, I, I can I can speak to that. Um, I have a poem that I spent 12 years writing and I could not get anywhere with it. It was a very important poem. And uh, to me, it was about a very important, important experience. And finally, I just actually finished an essay about the process of writing this poem. I only got anywhere when I realized it did want to be a villanelle and it should be a villanelle. And it hit me all at once. I'd been messing around with this poem for years and years and never getting anywhere. And all of a sudden it hit me, it had to be a villanelle. And that changed everything. It just opened it up. And it was a traumatic experience it was about. And in my teaching, I've really discovered, I was very interested in Jenna's remark that the villanelle occupies the crux between the narrative and the lyric. And I feel this may have something to do with my sense that the villanelle is actually a healing form, that it, it can really heal trauma in my students when um, when we're working on writing about traumatic material it seems the villanelle and, and other repeating forms as well but I think in a sense the villanelle may be the repeating form par excellence I mean it's just that exact process of saying the lines over and over and again uh, referring to what Jenna was saying about giving them that life as you repeat them changing them just enough I, I find that a very healing process like it, it it sort of duplicates the feeling of going back to a traumatic event over and over and gradually changing it and gradually making it your own and um, and it's in a way of sort of spiraling back and back. So after I did realize all of a sudden that this poem wanted to be a villanelle, it took years of revision to get it right, but uh, it turned out to be a really important poem for me now. It's going to be the very first poem in my new book. It was um, published in poetry, which has not happened to me often. So it's a poem that, you know, that really turned out to, to matter a lot to me. And I think it was only when I don't think I could have rushed it becoming a villanelle. It's like it, I had to have a certain strength to, to approach turning it into a villanelle. But um, I'm really glad that I, that I waited until it became that instead of trying to turn it into something else. Um, that's beautiful. I, I've never been able to take a poem that was not initially a villanelle and make it into a successful villanelle. I've tried a couple of times I feel like I can always see the seams. Um, to me personally, I think um, often, I think I think it's harder to fit to fit something into the to to approach the villanelle with this. If you know, if it, if it doesn't it doesn't feel natural, often it's it's hard to make the final product feel natural. But I, I love what Annie's saying about it being a healing form and about approaching it with the mindset. Actually, your comment reminds me that I should probably add that uh, this one turned in turned out to be a very odd villanelle because the repeating lines are identical. Mm -hmm. So they both um, end, they both end with the word root. So it's instead of rhyming, they actually repeat each other. So it's a, it's a pretty strange going on in that sense. Mm -hmm. And I, I think sometimes I have to make it even more artificial in order to make it natural. Mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. I was just thinking of the many drafts of um, Bishop's one art which, you know, to my mind is probably the greatest Philadelphia ever written, if you, if you have to pick just one, but didn't she start out as just sort of prose notes and she kind and then she kind of gravitated toward the Villanelle form? I'm trying to remember. I see Angie nodding. That's a, I know it's in that book, Alice, edited by um, Alice. Uh, the, yeah, the book yeah. Of Edgar, like, Edgar I, and I could go pull it off my oh, shelf. Could you? <laughs> if you I would to. love that. I would but love I to think see she that. did, you know, kind of start out with prose, you know, prose notes and then, you know, find the villanelle form for mm -hmm. it. I've done that, not just with the villanelle, but with other forms as well, you know, where I start out like trying to write in free verse and it's awful. And then all of a sudden it's like, 
just wants to be in haiku stanzas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> with other forms, but n never with a villanelle. It happens to me a lot yeah. with sonnets. I mm. find that, you know, an utterance just finds it. It, 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 it gains a power from being put into that form. I've just never, I guess, have that, had that experience yet with a villanelle. I'm excited to know. Yeah. Villanelle's for me, Annie talked about, you know, how anger motivated, you know, especially some of her early villanelles. But for me, it, it was always obsession. It was, you know, always the subject matter, something that's going round and round and round in my head. And yeah. I can't yeah. resolve it. And I can't stop kind of obsessing about it. And when I, when I put it in a villanelle, there's something about that final stanza, that extra line. I think of it as like when you're trying to like get your car, your car is stuck in ice and you're trying to rev, you know, <laughs> trying, to, <laughs> trying to get out of that rut. And that extra line is just like a little boost, you know, <laughs> and that, that extra line, somehow you can hit resolution or you know closure or insight or something you know it stops that cycle yeah. around and round and round and yeah. for me you know writing those villanelles is you know can be almost like a healing process I know we were talking you know a little bit about trauma and and you know there's something about that the way they end that does really seem to you know to heal mm -hmm. or to, to find to find an answer to something that you know that was very troubling Yes, yes. Right. To, to me, actually, it's interesting because when I've, I've found that the, the couplet, the AA couplet at the end of the of the villanelle, um, to, to me, almost sometimes it feels like a false resolution, but in a way that the that drives forward the narrative, right? Like, like to me, to me, sometimes I found that 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 last those last two lines is kind of like, you know, the it's like somebody clapping their hands, like two lines clapping together in a couplet. Someone is saying, you know, there I've achieved resolution. And then meanwhile, there's that quiet B voice whispering in the background, but have you really, you know? And so like the, there's like the, that, there's that, that bravado of the, the final couplet, but yours, it leaves you wondering, well, is that really, is that resolution really real? And you go back and you, you hear that kind of timing, doubt in the background. I think meter has a lot to do with it too. I love when villanelles, and we, when we were editing the book, um, there were, it was almost all iambic pentameter and I was so excited when I would find a villanelle in another meter because I feel it lends itself really well to other meters and uh, sometimes they have a freshness that creates more of that transformative effect mm -hmm. so that's another thing but uh, Jenna I love the way in yours you you really had a subtle the narrative was so subtly woven through uh, that it it almost created like an alter meter just in terms of the the thread of the story you know um so that was a really interesting way to hand i have to go find the plug of my computer which i just realized is about to to run out so i'm going to be back hopefully before i disappear but if i disappear i'll come right back in okay i'm going to take this moment just to invite um any one of our listeners to um pose a question to anyone on our panel if they would like to um just just unmute yourself and, and ask. I'll go, um, if that's okay. Um, I'm fascinated by hearing um, about the process of the poem telling you what it wants, you know, maybe right away, maybe 12 years, later and I think um, like how do you know what to listen for I guess what I'm hearing is if it's obsessions if you can't quite resolve it maybe you want to go to a villanelle um, it, is that the the is that how you hear your poems or that process is fascinating to me not a conscious decision for me. I just somehow usually know, you know, I, I, I know like, you know, when I work in, sometimes work in haiku stanzas, they tend to be very visual, almost like visual snapshotty kind of poems. And, you know, sonnets tend to have that, you know, sharp turn, you know, things are this way and then, whoop, you know, <laughs> that shift and, you know, villanelles and sessions, but I, I don't 
I don't sit down and rationally think that it, it just, you know, usually happens or I start writing and it's wrong and I, and I, and I realize it and switch, but it's not, it's, it's never really planned. I don't know. That, that might not be the case. Jenna, what about you? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've written unsuccessful. I, I could tell you lessons I've learned from my unsuccessful Bill and Nels. Um, I, I have found that when I try to uh, when I come in with content that's very visual, like, you know, a very clear image, um, it, it might, I, I find for me, Villanoise are the kind of more rhetoric driven poems, less driven by like a single clear image. Because I find repeating that image over and over, it, it starts to feel less fresh. Whereas re repeating like an idea or like a rhetorical gesture over and over, it sometimes I'm able to maintain the momentum of the poem better. So yeah, I, I do find, um, at least for me, like if it's, you know, something like, you know, if I go out for a walk in the woods, um, that might not necessarily turn into a, to an, turn into a, to a villanelle. Um, that to me, it's often more, the, for me, the villanelles that work slightly better are the ones that, where there's, there's like a narrative driving story that, something like that. But, but one, with, one, with, one with repetition, one with ambivalence, one with some sort of cognitive dissonance to it. Yeah. I love Jenna's statement about, you know, how it fuses narrative and lyric in the Villanelle and how the um, refrain advances the narrative. Um, I remember when I was researching my dissertation coming across a thing about, you know, broken records when, when in the old days when we had vinyl records and the, and the needle skipped, you would hear the same piece of music over and over and over again. And there is nothing more annoying than hearing, you know, it's chalk on a blackboard to hear that. And yet in a song or, you know, in a good villanelle, when that refrain comes around again, it's delightful. You know, we're delighted by it. And why? Because something has changed, you know, in the intervening time since we last heard it. It's familiar and yet something has advanced, has changed. So there's, you know, that recognition, but also, you know, kind of newness to its context when it, when it comes around again. There's something, I don't know, our brains, you know, kids love refrains. Um, there's something, the way our brains are kind of hardwired, I think, you know, many popular mm -hmm. songs have them. Yes, yes. Um, did anyone else have a um, question or a observation for our panel. Good, here comes Annie back again. Good. Hello, sorry. Right. <laughs> That's okay. That's actually, that sounds so fascinating. I was driving me crazy. Um, what you were all just talking about, about knowing when it works and when it doesn't. I'll just say, I've been teaching this class uh, I've, I've taught it once. Uh, we're about to do it for the second time. All women, all villanelles. And it's really a great combination. And I think there's a, set, there's a sort of forgivingness to the form uh, that it seems to allow people to, to move things around. I think, I think it's one of the interesting things about it. It seems like it's very rigid form in a certain sense, but yet once you're willing to take a little time, just actual legwork to move the refrains from one stanza to the next, there's actually a lot of flexibility. Uh, you, you can move the order of the stanzas and it'll have these radical effects that seem pretty seamless. Um, mm -hmm. It's a little and bit like a gazel that way, I feel, right? Like how each, each, when you, you know, each couplet is a little bit, or one way, not necessarily yeah. one way of approaching it, but the couplet's very self-contained, and then and then you can you can move them around at will afterward. Yeah, it's like it is self-contained in essence, even though it doesn't maybe look like it is, because it it can it sort of creates an, its own logic that obscures the fact that maybe there isn't as much as as it looks like underneath. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking that about the guzzle too. What is it, Aga Shahi Ali, who said that, like beads strung on a necklace, the, the stanzas, you could, you, yeah, you can yes. move around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things I found really interesting in the first Villanelle class that I took with you, Annie, um, last spring was when you said that um, it didn't need to be um, a metered form, like the sonnet is, you know, usually in a rather metered form. 
but that as long as it was accentual, like had the same number of beats per line, you know, you didn't have to scan it like a meter. And I found that very, very freeing um, after having tried to fit iambic pentameter or trochaic pentameter into my sonnets you know, to have this, um, this relative freedom of just bum, 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 Yeah, it can be almost like a jazzy form or a sort of counterpoint form. And it was when I was going to slam poetry readings in San Francisco as an undergrad, as a grad student, sorry, I would, A Villanelle was the first poem I read that helped me realize that people were really, that there was not such a thin, not such a line between formal verse and oral performance verse. In fact, they kind of met around the, you know, they, they appeared to go opposite directions and ended up meeting um, more than free verse even, I thought, because the, the Villanelle, you can just kind of, you know, riff on it and uh, create it a more of a jazzy effect sometimes. Yeah, yeah. In preparing for the piano, I was kind of looking back at some of my own villanelles, and then, like the one I read has has six beats per line, and I have others that have two beats per line. It gives such such a different effect, and it's uh, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we're, we're used to the ambient pentameter the most, but it becomes a, it feels like a, almost a totally different form when you have yeah. yes, yes, yes. I've yeah. seen a, a few that are like three beats, four beats per line. Yeah, the one I read has four strong beats per line. It's not iambic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not rather, yeah. And the, the one of my own that's in the Villanelle book is Amphibrax, which is really fun. <laughs> which is a subject for another time, I think, yeah. because I would like to again invite anyone in our our audience to um, pose a question. You, you can raise your, your virtual hand if you don't feel like you want to just burst into words. Diane, I had a question. This is Janice. Hi. Uh, Hi, I wondered, Hi if, I wondered if any of the writers had any comments on when you choose a villanelle over uh, a poem such as a sestina or a pantoum that also have repeating lines. I've tried all three forms uh, and I wondered if they had any comments on that since they do have repeating lines also. Oh, I've worked, I've worked in both those forms and I find with me, um, I've written about three sestinas and I love to use that form when there is a situation that I want to keep looking at from different angles. It's like in every stanza, I turn the thing and <laughs> approach it from a different perspective. I don't know if that makes any sense. And the, the pantoum is really good for something where you want to go forward and something's pulling you back, something from the past kind of pulling you back. That, that's the energy I get from that form. But um, again, you know, it, it's just kind of like unconscious for me. It's, you know, like later, you know, I, I, I look at them and, you know, and come up with these rationalizations. <laughs> I'm not sure that's what's happening when, yeah. I, when I write them. Yeah, it seems that the Sestina is more about the meditating, more of the mind, and the Villanelle is more of an emotional energy. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And, and to me, I feel, I feel such a crucial part of the Villanelle is that, is that they're so, I mean, it's, I think it's one of the, well, it's one of the very old forms, I think, where there's the, the same rhymes are turned through from the very beginning to the very end, right? So it's very, I mean, like a pantoum, it kind of stutters forward, but it does move forward in a, in a Way it, it leaves the you know, it leaves behind. It, it may come full circle depending on how traditionally you're doing it. But mm -hmm. I, Jenna, I Jenna, yeah. your your um your sound is reverberating. Um, oh, um, yeah. What I don't know what you did, but what you were doing before was super. But I've lost a lot of what you just said for about the past thirty minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was sorry, saying that thirty minutes, thirty seconds. Thirty seconds. Second. Please repeat because it sounded so interesting. Yeah, I, I was just saying yeah. that. Like, as far as I'm aware, the Villanelle is the only form where the same rhymes from the very beginning are carried through all the way to the end. You don't see this in a sonnet where, you know, mm -hmm. rhymes might carry through the octet, but then you get to the sestan, and it's totally new rhymes. Mm -hmm. So it's like with, with a pantoum, with a pantoum, the pantoum stutters along, but it leaves, mm -hmm. essentially does leave behind the rhymes it was using before to take on new ones as it, as it moves ahead with a sort of steady, slow and stuttering, but steady progress. And to me, I, I think what's fast, what, what's fascinating about, about the Villanelle makes it unique is just having 
having those rhymes that go all the way through that there's sort of a an unwillingness behind the place where you started that's fascinating yeah yeah i'm thinking that the GLA kind of does it but it's it's much more of a yeah, yeah. Imagery. yeah but the villanelle there's something yeah. so wonderfully simple about the villanelle the way it repeats the same things throughout and then the end changes the beginning's a little different the ending's a little different but otherwise it's just there so i, I found that it, it seems to sort of speak to my unconscious in a, mm-hmm. a very direct way yeah, yeah. yeah. janet yeah. janet did you say this is janice again did you say th- at the end there that the villanelle uh, leaves you with an unwillingness to find the place you started or a willingness i i, I guess to me um I, I mean, it's it's so different for everybody, but for me, I feel the the villain now comes out of a place of of unwillingness to leave behind the place you started, right? Okay. That, I, I, don't, I don't see that so much, at least in it, it's each form is so different for me. The Sestina, when I'm hearing a Sestina, like ninety nine percent of the time, I don't realize that it's a Sestina I'm hearing, you know. Um, but the, the villain now, it's with with, the, with the, those rhymes that just carry through from the very beginning to the very end. I feel like it. There's a, there's a, it seems to embody a, a stubbornness or like Julie said, like stubborn, like an obsession. So. Oh, good Great. point. I understand. Yes, Thank you. Thanks I for won't explaining. Let this go. Yeah. That's a very interesting way of looking at it too. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, everybody. You, you, you addressed that very nicely. I, I love Sestinas, but they're, they're very easy to do poorly. <laughs> and you can just, <laughs> just go, go winding on and on and, uh, and uh, just not get anything said. So, uh, but when it works, it really works well. So, uh, and same with Villanelle and Pantum, of course. Great. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Think of the Sestina is like a kaleidoscope, you know, where you turn it and all the little squares of, you know, of glass, like oh. ring a finger. It's just, yeah. you know, each stanza is like a little turn. Good description. Yeah, that's a good yeah. description. Yeah, yeah. Another, do I see a hand? Another question, Kathleen. Kathleen. Um, Annie, you use the word incantatory um, to talk about the villanelle. And I think that's a really great word. Would you say that the villanelle form is the most incantatory form of poems? Or is there another that that has that same kind of incantatory quality? That's a great question. Um, I'm thinking about the canzone, which I've only written a couple of. Uh, there's it's a, such a super challenging, difficult form. Speaking of Aga Shahid Ali, that was a form that he was very big on and wrote one on his deathbed. But it's um, the canzone. It's a different kind of incantational quality. It's more. Um, quiet and kind of like the, ro- the roaring of the ocean, but the villanelle feels more like a human incantation to me. It's, uh, I would say, it, I, I guess it does feel to me like the most incantatory form, and maybe that's why I'm so drawn to it, because incantation is one of my things. I have a book called Spells, and um, yeah, it, it does seem to, to cast a spell. The combination of the repetition and the changing at the same time, which is the thing I love most about poetic form and the villanelle seems to just elevate and isolate it so that it's in a very pure form. In English too, there are poems that are literally incantations. I'm thinking of one that um, I loved in Jerome Rothenberg's, I think, Shaking the Pumpkin Anthology, a Native American Alaskan poem that I think it was that like caribou, caribou, boo, boo, caribou, you know, and it's meant to actually make the caribou materialize, you know, for the hunt. It's um, kind of a, a magical poem. Yeah. 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 You know, it chants yeah. the caribou into being. Yeah, as if the, the incantation is addressed to the the oversoul of caribou yeah exactly this group of caribou come come please come (laughs) to us and because the bones of the villanelle are so relatively simple it allows you to change it quite a bit i mean there are some really interesting adaptations and 
you know, you, you can play around with it in, in a way that heightens different incantational uh, aims and effects, I think, as well. So, yeah, you make me want to write a whole series of villanelle spells. <laughs> villain spells. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. You get the acknowledgement, Kathleen. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, this is so rich. Um, we don't want nice. to wear you out, Julie and Jenna and Annie. Um, how, how, are, how is your energy feeling? Are you up for another question or two? Or are you ready to wind things down? I know you've got an event later, Annie. So I don't want to, I want to give you time to. Yeah, um, I'm up for another question. I would love nothing. I love nothing more than talking about villanelles. I can't okay. even, I can't imagine another whole class I'd want to do on, on a one form. You know, um, I've taught workshops on the sonnet for a day or two, but to do, I think it's going to be four weeks on one form. I don't think there'd be another one other than the Villanelle I'd ever want to do that with. So yeah, I've got energy. <laughs> Nancy, Nancy, yeah, hi. Yeah, Nancy, and hi, Annie. Good to see you again. Um, I was reading something you wrote, Annie, about the Villanelle about the first, the A line, the first line and the last line being two um, threads Lovers. that want to come together. <laughs> and, and, and that the poem evolves so that you have the tension of them being apart and some way for them to kind of resolve together, which is a little what you've been talking about with the healing quality of it. But, you know, when you know you're going to have a line that repeats and repeats, you pay a lot of attention to what lines you choose. And I had never thought, I mean, I've hardly written one or two villanelles in my life, but I hadn't thought about paying attention to what's in those two lines and how far apart you want them to start and where they're going to figure out where they end up. You're not going to force them together. But Yes, exactly. I, I'm so glad you mentioned that because when I was talking about the healing effect, I think I was thinking more about just repeating the same lines over in these different ways, you know, um, and as Jenna had said, you know, giving them that different edge each time. But this other aspect of the Villanelle, which I, I that might have been the introduction to the Villanelle book or also my book, A Poet's Craft, is where I, I first came up with this idea that I, it's a very erotic form, the Villanelle, because it's like these two, these two lines have this magnetic energy between them and you're kind of keeping them apart and keeping them apart, but you know, at the very end, they're finally going to get together and touch. And it's just <laughs> so exciting really. And yeah. so, yeah, when, when people are starting out, I usually advise them to just look at those two lines apart and look at those two lines together and make sure that it's worth all the effort of writing a Villanelle for that moment when they join, that they really have that chemistry. <laughs> That's great. So you're the, the Yenta of Villanelles. There you go. <laughs> Annie, Julie, I'm just curious. Do you always start by writing those two refrain lines first? I know that's, or have you, ha, has a Villanelle ever come to you in any other way? That's such a good question. I think, yeah, I think the one that when Diane was asking if something had started out as another poem and turned into a Villanelle, I think that one that I realized finally was going to be a Villanelle, um, I think in that one, the way it ended up that they had the same repeating line and they didn't actually rhyme was that I never did come up with the second line, but I just kept going because I had, yeah, it was so urgent. And then I decided to make, to put them together and didn't even realize that I was repeating the line that that first time I turned it into a Villanelle, that I was repeating the same word uh, in both lines. So yeah, that was maybe one of the only times if I set out to write one, I'm usually doing what you just said and putting the two lines together. Julie, what about you? I, I only start with the tercet with the first three, you know, and, and, and I guess I don't think about them coming together till I get to the end and then it's, then it's exciting, but not, not in the end. Yeah, I love what you said about the kissing, the, the two lines kissing at the end too and the one I read, I had never thought of it that way. I didn't even say kissing, but on yours, about kissing across the bar, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jenna, what about you? Has that happened with you? 
I, I know, like, I, I guess I remember a teacher somewhere back in the day saying you should always start with the, with the two lines. I think there is a wisdom in that because, again, again, like you said, like you, you might go through all this effort only to write, realize the two lines don't want to be together at all. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> what the poem I read, the reader, I started, I also started out with the tercet and then I kind of went from there and it, it felt like, it felt like I was starting wrong and I kind of had to kind of work, you know, I, 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 a lot of my poems, I, I, I think I do start with it, with it, with the, the beginning and kind of work forward chronologically. Yeah. And then it becomes, uh, there, there's a, there's sort of a, a, a struggle to, to get it back to how the form wants, you know, that, that, yeah. that's another tension into the writing process. And also the discovery. Yeah. And the surprise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you all wrote a Villanelle for today. That's exciting. We did. And I think um, I, I feel a lull. So this might be a good time to end our recorded portion and then move into, um, into our open mic, which is not really long. So we have just 11 readers, unless someone else is adding. I'm going to add just one more thing, if I could. Um, and yes. add just a little memory that just popped back into my head. Um, when that book, The Villanelle Anthology, came out, um, I had planned it for 20 years. And I want to shout out to Carolyn Kaiser, who I met in San Francisco when I was there at Stanford as a grad student. She was such a wonderful a mentor to younger women poets, even in the 90s when, um, or very early 90s, when, you know, of course, not many women were really mentoring other women because they didn't have the power to do it, but she did. And she was really quite lovely and gave me a poem for my first anthology, which was called A Formal Feeling Comes, Poems Informed by Contemporary Women, which came out in 93, kind of a response to the uh, situation that Julie described at the very beginning of this event. Um, and Carolyn Kaiser gave this wonderful Villanelle and um, she got me thinking about Villanelles. I was sort of surprised because I hadn't seen that many Villanelles at that time. It was based on a line from Paul Valeray, I think. And um, then, so I got this sort of seed and she, I started thinking about the Villanelle then and got the seed to someday edit a book of Villanelles, which I kept in the back of my mind. And it took 20 years until I found someone to do it with me and I finally had time and I just moved forward with it. And then when the book came out, we had the launch party at the Bowery Poetry Club in New York City. And I was so blown away because it felt like a dream come true. You know, when you think about something your whole life and then all of a sudden it's real and it happened and you're like, what planet am I on? What's happening? What lifetime am I in? It's just the strangest feeling. And the thing that really blew me away was the variety of poets, because in putting this book together, I, I, in all my editing, I've edited like 12 books, um, and in all of them, I've always tried to, to find poets from many different aesthetic camps, because there has been, in, in my decades coming up, so much conflict between the formalists and the experimental poets and the free verse, and all of these kind of politics and things. And I've always felt that form itself has the potential to unite so many different kinds of people among a common around a common uh, concern and love of, of repetition and pattern and the physical qualities of poetry. And that was really true in editing this book. And just that night at Bowery Poetry Club, I think there's a photo online somewhere. We had like experimental people like Charles Bernstein and Leanne Brown. And then we had these old fashioned formalists. And then we had, you know, just kind of free verse poets who'd just written one. But there was such a variety of poets and a lot of poets of color who'd come in through like Cave Canem. And um, it, it was just such a treat to have all these poets from all over the map together in, in one room. And the Villanelle had, had brought us all there. And I'll never forget that reading. We're just hearing people read one Villanelle after the next coming from so many different perspectives and, and what a gift it was. And it was almost like it was left the fire, like a hearth that we were all gathering around this particular form. Wow. So even though Julie tells us it was sort of an accident, I'm really glad that that person made a parody of that first Villanelle and turned it into a thing. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Oh, well, thank you for saying that. And thank you so much, all, all, for the three of you, for joining us and for, for reading your work. And 
um, Jenna and Julie and Annie, just, just Villanistas Supreme. Thank all of you for Zooming with us and please stay online for the next part of our program. To everyone who's listening in on YouTube, please consider joining us on October 12th, our next regularly scheduled second Tuesday event, when at 6 p.m. we'll hear San Francisco poet Elise Kazanchian. Thanks again for joining us at Coastside Poetry and for helping to 